We're going to move, continue to move on as we're starting to run behind again a little bit. We're going to go into the educational funding panel. Uh, Dr. Steve Holan, who was our past chairman and I got to work with in the senior team these last uh, two years, uh, with, is the moderator, and he will introduce his uh, panel. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, we'll give some time for our uh, panel to come up to the stage. But to introduce myself, as uh, Daryl said, I'm Steve Holan. I'm the superintendent of schools for McKenzie County School District Number 1 in Watford City. I uh, have been since 2005, so in my 13th year. also been a member of the executive committee for, as you heard earlier, with the, for a number of years. And uh, we'll be finishing out the last year of my third term uh, this coming year. So. Um, I, I want to catch up on time a little bit, and it's a great privilege to have two senators up here. We have the chairman of the Senate Education Committee and the vice chair of the Senate Education Committee here today. So I really want them to do a lot. And we have Leslie Beaver, and that's not anything. Gonna, just to keep them in line, that's why they're strategically placed one between each other. Um, but basically, I, I, before I uh, turn it over and we ask a few questions, just to give a little bit of baseline on on education funding and uh, gross production tax. Uh, the one thing that's been real uh, interesting the last several years and since 2005 being associated in Watford City has been uh, the role of gross production tax in school funding. And it's been a critical part of our school district's funding, obviously, for many, many years. Uh, but the other part that comes out is a lot of misconceptions. And, and certainly when it comes to uh, gross production tax, there's a lot of uh, uh, maybe misinformation. Or otherwise, uh, it, it gets confusing. Uh, to say the least, because of the one, we're the one political subdivision that has this other entity that we deal with because we do receive funding from the state uh, because education, K-12, is a, is a function of the state. Uh, so we blend those two funding sources together, and less over the years, things have really changed as far as how those two really fit together. Uh, there was a perception that we don't get to keep our uh, oil and gas production tax revenue. That's not necessarily true, but it is offset on the state funding side and then we get different percentages. So it can be confusing, but we do want to keep it kind of at a, at a higher level just to get general principles of what really does happen. So very briefly, just to give you an overall of how this has worked, uh, you know, schools have been involved since 57 with the gross production tax. We were the highest uh, recipient of that at that time. I think it was 45%. In 1981, uh, we had the formula that we knew for many years, which was 45% counties, 35% uh, schools, and 20% to the cities. Um, at that time in 81 and all the way up to 2007, uh, that money was not accounted for in the funding formula for schools. So that money was receded just like any other political subdivision and we could use it for whatever we chose to do as in lieu of property tax base. In 2007, I think it was Senate Bill 2200, uh, really changed the landscape for schools because at that point uh, it was following the lawsuit, it was the Commission on Education that took place at that time that the amount of revenue received for gross production tax was now factored in. And it was a little different back then. It was based on an average. Uh, our school district, ironically at the time, never really got impacted by it uh, because you had to be above 150% of the average valuation, and it wasn't a factor. Uh, but it was accounted for. And at that point, it was 60%, and the second year it meant to 70%. In 2009, uh, the caps were removed, which is a major uh, achievement. But the above cap money for schools wasn't given to us directly. It was put into an infrastructure fund, and you could only ask for basically buses. So we would go to the county and ask, we need so many buses, and out of that infrastructure fund, they would give us some of those funds. The rest went to the Road and Bridge Club. So 2009, it was kind of pivotal. They, the message basically was that you will continue to get some of this funding, but we don't really want it to go to general operating because of that equity issue. Let's give it to impact things. And buses was the first kind of tier of that. Uh, 2011, hub cities came into the mix, and so now three of our school districts were treated differently based on a hub city definition, which we still have in place now. 2013, we finally broke through, and after the cap, we got included again at 5%. Uh, so we went from 35 to 5, post the 5 million. Uh, there was a little issue there as far as how that transition happened uh, that got fixed, but basically we're, we were back in at some level after that point. Um, and then in 2015, we received uh, $30 million of impact grant uh, funding that was distributed through a, a formula to the schools. And this money was not counted against, and it was defined that we had to use it for infrastructure and or debt capacity. 
so basically now in 2017, uh, the hub city definition got changed. So every year since 2007, uh, there's been a slight change for schools. And it's really become, I think, a challenge for the legislature because how do we deal with schools uh, because of the equity factors and all these things really became uh, part of the play. But uh, I think the role today is to talk about there's a very active process right now with looking at the funding formula, looking at in lieu of revenue on the state side of how they view uh, revenues that are received uh, by school districts in oil country, um, and also on the gross production tax side, as far as how are we going to be included with this moving forward. So basically, like this kind of uh, jump starts the discussion, I guess, and I'm going to have each panelist come up and give a little bit of their background and I guess their perspective uh, through their current position or otherwise on the gross production tax and uh, funding for schools. So we'll start with Senator Scheibling. Uh, good afternoon or morning. Thank you for uh, the invitation to visit with you today. Uh, Don Shively, I represent District 31, which is Hedinger County, Grant County, part of Morton County, and Sioux County. Um, I uh, chair the Senate Education Committee. I also chair the Education Funding Interim Committee. I serve in the Governor's Task Force for Innovation. I serve on the DPI's uh, uh, focus group for, for their future. I also represent the Senate in the Education Commission of the States and also represent the Senate on the SLEDS Committee, uh, State Longitude Data Systems Committee. Um, he uh, gave a very good uh, description of our, our funding formula with uh, added some more, I mean, more to it because of uh, uh, the, f uh, the property tax relief portion of, of uh, a property tax that came into, into play on our funding formula has also raised some issues with that. Part of what our, our committee, uh, Education Funding Committee, is supposed to do for, uh, for is looking at the issues that have come up with our, with our, uh, our formula based on, on issues. Uh, last meeting that we had, we had uh, eight different schools come in and explain how differences in the formula affect them or adversely affect somebody else. The issue with that is we got property risk districts, property poor districts, uh, student enriched, you know, student uh, growing districts, student declining districts, and all kinds of other things that happen. Uh, you know, one of the things that we really struggle with is is uh, the equity and equality issue of, of our of our state funding formula. Uh, meeting with uh, the Educational Leaders Association, their focus group, it's interesting to see how they also go around and around that uh, do we have a funding issue or do we have an e equity equality issue? And most of the time, it, it's the equity equality issue that we have to protect on that. So as far as the gross protection tax and, and the, the value that I see for, for education, it's a big part of our education formula, and it's, it's, it's greatly needed for what we do. Out of this last session, when we were short of money, K-12 was basically held harmless. And that, even though it, it's hard to see that with some of our schools, we, we stuck a lot of money into keeping uh, K-12 not being hurt by deductions of what budget cuts from everybody else. We had the pre-session before that with the government's allotment, and then also uh, during the session where everybody got budget cuts and that K-12 was held harmless. big part of that was the money that came from the gross production tax in, in our, in our uh, stabilization uh, fund and also in the foundation aid stabilization fund. Foundation Aid Stabilization Fund was measure number two in the last last election of last year. Uh, because of that, people in North Dakota said we could spend that excess money, and of that, $160 million went into sure, uh, shoring up our payments for this year. It also gave us, you know, the availability to what the governor allotted before that of the money that was used to shore up that. So K-12 was not not affected by the allotments or the budget shortfalls and that. So it's a great big part of that, you know. So and it's a vast topic, so I'll, I'll just leave it at that, and we'll let somebody else continue. Hello, I'm Leslie Bieber. I'm the superintendent of Alexander Public School. Um, we're right, many people ask me where Alexander is. We're right in the heart of the Bakken between Watford and Williston. Um, how, I'm not going to talk about the legislative part. I'm going to talk about what the 25% that we're able to keep gross production tax has done for my school. Since 2010-11, where we truly, I'm going to start back, in 2005-2006, my school had 41 kids kindergarten through 12. Um, if you read the minutes from then, they talked about keeping the doors open. When you are looking at keep trying to keep them open for one more year, there is there's not a large investment in keeping them up to date. By 2010, they had 82 kids. 
We are currently at 1617 at 245. We've seen 300% increase since the oil has come. We've completely renovated our building and added additional square footage um, of new construction in order to accommodate the kids. When I arrived in 1314, there were 15 computers for 82, or for, excuse me, for 165 students. We are now one-to-one -one initiative. We see firsthand the work ethic. What we are promoting is work ethic. And you all know in the field, as some 20-some-year-old kid who has work ethic and can pass a drug test can move very far, <coughs> can move, it can advance greatly. And how do we promote that work ethic? And still, I listen to what's going on with the CO2 and Dr. Holmes, some of the things that you guys are doing. I'm so excited for, to speak with them and talk to them about coming to my school and telling us what we need to do, because that's our goal, is to develop those kids for our increasingly competitive world. Um, so the gross production tax, what it has done for us has allowed us to, to, to keep up with that. We are K through 12 STEM. Um, we have robotics programs. We have medical detective, which I really like to go in when there's a corpse. It's fake, thankfully. But um, we've really been able to work um, with our, our energy excuse me, companies. They've been very supportive. And that is, so that's all I'm going to say as far as the gross production tax. I know that the equity is definitely there and how it fits into our formula. And we're keeping 25%. Um, I'm kind of going into a further question that Steve has, but the misconception in a lot of soups from the other areas give me, tease me about coming from a rich district. Uh, they forget about that 75% deduct that comes out of it. And I have to tell you, as a brand new soup, the first time that I received a $500,000 $500, check, I was ecstatic. And then I learned they take 75% the next year. <laughs> I called Steve. Uh, asked him what I do with this. Uh, you know, and we have all kinds of impacts because then we can only grow 12% on the dollar. So even though we received 62 new kids this year, that's a big impact on a little school. Um, I was predicting 20 to 25. So just in technology textbooks, additional teachers and additional staff to support that. Yes, we have a rapid enrollment grant. Woohoo! Additional 276,000 until you call the state and, tell, and they find out there's growth all over the state and it's probably, you don't really know what you're going to get. So those are the things that thankfully as a superintendent, I know that 25% of oil production tax is coming in. And it's kind of a save my hide in the end. So we don't budget with it. We uh, are able to, to stay on top and continue to grow. Um, and we talked about transportation when I arrived, we had five Suburbans and one large bus. That's how we transported our students. You cannot transport 200 and some kids with five Suburbans and one bus. So all of those things are, are how, the, how the gross production tax ha has not just impacted us financially, but in the direction that we go, we've completely revamped in the education in order to fill your needs. So. Um, I don't know how much more I'm going to get to this mic with these two gentlemen. So I'm just going to close with um, <laughs> pure respect there, gentlemen. Um, <laughs> I am going to close any time that you um, would like to come into our schools and guide our kids, guide my teachers, see what we are doing and see what we can do. It's like me pretending that I'm a teacher. I haven't been in, that, in a classroom for a long time. My teachers are the ones that are in the trenches. You in the energy field are in the trenches. So what can I do to produce the workforce that you need in today's world? So don't ever be shy to call us. Thank you. Good morning. I'm David Rust. I represent the great Northwest, as the program says, it, which is um, the very Northwest corner state, all of Divide County, Burke County, um, all of Williston, I mean, all, all of Williams County, with the exception of most of Williston, and about uh, a number of sections from Montreal County, including Stanley. In 1980, I came to Tioga as the school superintendent. Uh, they... Uh, I fooled them for 28 years, and they kind of kept me around. Uh, so, it and it was a great place to work. And um, 
During that time period, we went from about 620 kids down to 230, and then we started going up, and uh, they rose to greater heights uh, after I left. I, re I retired in 2008 and went to the dark side. I mean, I went to uh, into the legislature and uh, uh, served uh, three term three sessions in the House and two in the Senate. I'm currently on the uh, Education Committee of the Senate. I'm vice chair of that. And I am currently on the Energy Development and Transmission Committee and the Education Funding Committee. And both of them, it's a good deal because both of them are talking about some of the same things. Basically, the gross production tax and in lieu of dollars and the uh, property tax, 12%. And I think with that, I'll just uh, stop and let us go to questions. Okay, um, I, I know we're going to be short on time too, so I'm just going to kind of jump to some of the, the, the bigger questions of the day, I guess. And one of the, the misconceptions when you talk about the, the formula and how it works uh, you know, many of us have gone through building projects of, of varying kinds. We go through a public, we vote on these, and uh, we look for the support. The mis one of the misconceptions is that, well, you receive this gross production tax money, that, that should help with this. That should not be a complete burden on the local taxpayer. Uh, the reality is that uh, this in lieu of money that comes into us is, is deducted off the formula. Um, it can be used for debt, but it's penalized. you're penalized in doing so. Uh, so whether you use it for salaries, whether you use it for debt, uh, it's going to get deducted off the formula no matter what. You know, and that's been one of the issues we've talked about with the committee, that I think the real intent of that money was to deal with infrastructure issues. It was to take that burden off. And if you're looking at it from that capacity, because I know in my district, we're using a lot of gross production tax for debt repayment. And, and in that way, I'm thinking I'm not maybe being treated equally because I'm getting deducted on my formula when other places across the state are not getting deducted in their formula when they're making those debt payments. But the way that this formula is structured, it kind of does provide that penalty. So, but basically, I'm going to throw it out uh, to any of the panelists, but probably a couple uh, legislators then. Um, the, the main topic that comes up a lot now in the interim is, is about um, property tax, because property tax relief is a big opponent of school funding. Um, and there's a 12% there's a cap on that. There's, there's lower levies in our areas that has been viewed as maybe an equity issue of some kind. Um, so I'm just curious in general um, of any of the panelists, what's going to be important this next legislative session as far as school funding? And you could either take the gross production side or you can take the school funding side as far as what's going to be important. So, Oh, come on up. Uh, yeah, and that's the mission of our Education Funding Committee and, and uh, you know, Let's go back just just a little bit on that. We switched our, our funding formula, you know, to a uh, um, population generated system, which means now it's based on per students. We've taken out more of the share of her students. Checking uh, yesterday, um, we have 109,026 students. That's uh, 400 uh, 422 students over what we projected for this year. The other thing is, is that'll probably put us at over 2,100 for the biennium of new students. Now, what what that happens with? We get paid for 96, uh, uh, 96, uh, 46 for for our payment for our students. Now, what happens with that is with the cost to continue. So, what we're looking at for that is is uh, we have to make up that difference for those students, you know, which we didn't predict for. The other thing is, is we said something about our funding formula as far as the equity with the balance of what we're, what we're trying to do with the, with our students. Some of his money was impeded. Some, we talked about rapid enrollment in that. One of the issues that we're looking at in our interim funding committee is, is the maybe uh, of, of looking at uh, on-time funding. Right now, you're funded on last year's enrollment, and, and uh, you know, and that's what you get. So that really hurts some schools. When you had, we talk about the rapid enrollment for some of these kids, what we're looking at is is for some of these that are over, you know, high amount of, of students, and we, we consider rapid enrollment of over 4% growth, and, and some of these obviously are way more than that. So what we're looking at in, in part of our committee is 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 doing um, paying on-time funding for the schools that would qualify for rapid enrollment. And in the case of, of Alexandra and West Fargo, Williston, some of these other ones, 
And but the thing is, is there's a huge price tag to that. And, and so now it's the dilemma of how do we increase funding for for our state for our schools with with uh, you know increasing the 9646 to what we want to pay our school districts and the cost to continue for these for these new students. So it's kind of a dilemma of what we got to do. But we are looking at hopefully that we can raise the amount for that. Look at some on time funding instead of the rap, uh, rapid enrollment grants, but we certainly can't do it all at one time. So it's going to be looked at in stages. For some of that would help. The other thing is, as we talked about the in lua and the 12%, part of the problem with our 12% funding was is that when we built our formula in 1213, we put a 60 million, a 60 mil a basis on local share. That's what the school districts were have to have participation as a local share. But what we had on that was also a dollar figure on that. What we should have used was a 60 mil dollar equivalent. Because of the valuation increases that we've experienced in the last six to eight years, and because of that 60 million cap, we have seen school districts being penalized because they can't raise enough of the 12% so their mills goes down. And since they're not at 60 mills, they're basically considered that they're not contributing in their local shares. That's one of the other areas we're looking at in our funding formula in, in our study is, is to understand the difference between that 12% growth. One other issue to that, uh, should uh, new property that, uh, you know, new buildings or new property of stuff that's gone that, should that be included in the 12% cap as far as, as what happens as far as that? Because the 12% cap's on there so that people just don't get retaxed over and over and the growth of that is, is included. But should new property be included in that 12% cap? If we uh, look at that and make some changes, then that will also greatly help our funding formula with the discrepancies between some of these districts that are having major growth but also bumping up against the cap. And like I said, it's a vast subject, but that's just a touch of it. So. I'm going to talk a little bit about the gross production tax, okay, uh, and the effect on school districts. As Steve pointed out, you know, there was a time where it wasn't counted against us at all, and then we went to an imputation, which for the most part didn't hurt us very much either. And then in 2013, with the funding formula, we went to a 75% subtraction. And the first thing I want to say about gross production tax is, and please keep this in capital letters, about 60 bold, it is in lieu of property tax. Okay? Can we all say that? No. I won't have you repeat it. But, but it is in lieu of property tax. Did I tell you? It's in lieu of property tax. Okay? And I'll give you an example of this. When I pay my property taxes, I send it to the county. They collect all these property taxes, and they send it back to the school districts. And when they send it back to the school district, they say, X number of dollars goes into your general fund. X number of dollars goes into your miscellaneous fund. X number of dollars goes into your sinking interest fund. X number of dollars goes into your building fund. OK? With regard to the gross production tax, they take the whole thing do not account for the fact that there, you know, that there are various funds that school districts levy for and subtract 75% of it. And um, I, that's one of the areas we have a small focus group that is looking at that. You know, should we take that gross production tax and do the same thing? Uh, I did check on all of the in lieu of um, monies that are doled out to school districts the county treasurer does tell how much goes into each of those funds, okay? I think the only two that they don't are flood monies and gross production tax, okay? To give you an idea, and I'm going to grab a sheet of paper here just real quick, like, and tell you that I took the nine big school districts, uh, no, I'm sorry, the nine big oil-producing counties, okay? And those are counties that produce over 5 million. Of those nine, there are the big four, you know, that produce over 100 million, $200 million, okay? And then you have five of them that drop off rather rapidly. And I looked at, for instance, the uh, amount of money they had, or amount of mills they had for general fund, 
in comparison to the total number of mills. And over those nine big producing counties, the average is that 65% of their total mill levy is general fund mill levy. Okay? And yet we subtract 75% the formula. That doesn't seem equitable to me. And if you take, you know, in some places it's higher or lower. It depends on the school district you're in and the county you're in. But there are some as low as 43% of their total levy is general fund. And yet if they get any oil and gas production tax dollars, it's subtracted at 75%. So currently we're looking at a couple of things. One is, should we split that dollar, those dollars out to the various levied funds by the school district and then take 75% of the general fund portion of it? Okay. The other one might be, if that's too complicated, maybe we should look at that 75%. And I think you can make a case, a very strong case, that it should be lower because... You know, people say, well, you subtract, your property taxes get subtracted from your formula. No, that's not really true. Only up to 60 mills. There are lots of other ones that are out there that are not subtracted at all, you know. And um, so we're looking at probably those couple of items. And I think with that, I'll probably stop and go to another question. We're right at 11.40, Daryl. I got, I got the five-minute call. Is this on? Um, and I don't want to uh, cut into Senator Warner's time at all, and um, I knew it was going to be crunched for time. But one of my last uh, takeaways, and, and I could have the, the panel, if they want to step in and talk about it too, is uh, you know, what are, why is it important for schools to be part of the funding formula and as part of the WDEA? Uh, DEA? And I think that the, the message basically is, and the misconception is, well, they're not going to keep the money anyway, so why are we giving them money only to have the state take it away? Uh, we do get to keep those funds, but it's important that as we work with our legislative assembly is that uh, we're able to keep those funds for a lot of the infrastructure things, which is real property tax relief, and, and not just for general operating. Uh, the state has an obligation to equalize what we can offer educationally. There is no equalization factor for infrastructure as far as how we can accommodate our students. And right now, we're getting limited in that capacity a little bit with the way this is structured. So there's some changes that could happen uh, that could make that beneficial. So I guess, you know, that's one of the things that uh, I guess I wanted to take away out of this is to, we can educate, uh, have some responses to those perceptions because we deal with them every day, administratively, I'm sure legislatively they do as well. This is bonus money. This is jackpot money. And those that have lived it for a while understand that's just really not the case. So we need to be able to counter those misconception statements uh, as much as possible. So um, I want to, uh, I guess, offer any last comments from the panel. Any, Senator Russ, you didn't get a chance to talk about your siding. Uh, Hold on. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, and I want, pardon? How about this? How about this? Is this working? Okay. I want to talk about hub cities for a little bit, okay, um, and their continued funding. First of all, hub cities, over the course of time, through no fault of their own, have, have had to incur some extreme costs in infrastructure. And those, those were inserted into the formula to help pay for those infrastructure costs. And I think it's imperative that the hub cities do not get excluded or thrown to the wayside or reincorporated back into the formula. It also has implications for the smaller towns that are in that those two counties or three, basically because a lot of the money goes to to two cities, Williston and Dickinson. And then there's some that goes to Minot as well. But Williston and Dickinson, Williams County and Stark County. So if you were to eliminate hub cities, um, 
that would have a real detrimental effect to the smaller ones as well, because all of a sudden, all of that money would kind of be sucked out, as people see it, by the large, two large cities in those counties, because that's where the population is. So we really need to concentrate on that. Now, with regard to my siding, I can tell you that, you know, um, I lived in a school district. When I quit in 2008, the Tioga School District had a taxable valuation of $6.8 million. Last year, it was $67 million. Can you imagine that? In that short a period of time, in nine years, it was a tenfold increase in the taxable valuation in our school district. It is impossible for that school district, through the current means, to get to 60 mills because the tax valuation goes up so rapidly. So that's the aspect that uh, Senator Scheibler was talking about. Uh, I do say that, you know, back about 2006, my house was valued at about 80,000. It's now $280,000 and I put vinyl siding on. <laughs> I have really, really nice vinyl siding. <laughs> Any uh, quick questions? I know we gotta move on, so. Okay, Senator Beckett The agenda, but my question goes back to the creation of the equity formula because I was involved as president of the Oil and Gas Association at that time when the 75% imputation came into effect. Um, in the original creation, the federal payments in lieu of taxes were treated as anomalies in the formula and therefore excluded from any imputation. Can you, can you any of you tell us why? the gross production tax state payments, which are also in lieu of property taxes, were not also treated as not least in that time. Why are they they're imputed, but the federal ones are not? My recollection of that is that the federal law prohibited uh, <coughs> deduction for their money. The state did for the- Couldn't state law also prohibit that? Well, but I mean, that was the reason for it. I mean, um, those of us that were involved in that, you know, to be begin with, I think Vicki Steiner can vouch for the fact when I was president of this, of this group, and she came to us and said, should we consider? I think my exact answer was, hell no, we're not giving a damn thing. <laughs> and we worked, and we made that work for quite a while until the um, new funding formula came along, and then we kind of said we'd go to 50, they wanted 100, they essentially took. 75% uh, against our wishes. Uh, and I'll tell you, it probably settled at 75% to buy votes to get the funding formula passed. And Senator Beckendall, I think there's a great argument to be made that um, the gross production tax is, is not treated equitably. I mean, there's another side of the story that we're viewed as the, the inequity issue, but in actuality, there's some inequity in how we're treated as in the move of tax. So, um, I think I'm officially getting the hook now from Daryl. So <laughs> I do want to thank uh, Leslie Beaver for her time here. Uh, Senator um, Shively and Senator Russ, uh, tremendous advocates in the Senate for us. They've been great at working with our school district. So I really want to recognize their efforts because they've been great. And I do want to recognize Senator Wardner, another great advocate for our school. So we'll give him the podium. Thank you for your time.